What is service delivery and quality? Uh, service delivery and quality is the department name we came up with within DLA Piper that deals with the transformation of our front office. So we're not concerned with how efficient HR is, we're not concerned with how efficient finance is and all of those things. What we're looking at is how do we deliver our services to our clients efficiently and how do we improve the quality of that service for all the reasons that you've heard of this morning. Um, we are not holding ourselves out as legal project management experts. I would defy anyone to hold themselves out as legal project management experts. In fact, I would defy anyone to say there is classically something called legal project management. What we've done is we've looked at the challenges we have in our business and we've come up with a pragmatic approach. And the first thing that we've done, and this leads me into the introduction of James, is we've realised that there is a limit to what we can ask fee earners to do. If you read Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, he talks about the capacity we have to deal with a number of things at any one time, and we have limits and constraints on us. And the fact of the matter is, they've got to be great lawyers, they've got to be great, uh, uh, great at building business, they've got to be great at a whole bunch of things. You throw another thing on that cart, another, another challenge like legal project management, and it's just too difficult. Things stop happening, and that isn't a criticism of lawyers. We've all got a capacity to what we can do, and I think what we've done is we've taken a much more pragmatic approach and said, how can we actually get people to help us project manage? So we've hired a bunch of project managers, of which James is one of them. Yeah, my background, um, I was a FIANA in the first place, moved into uh, the management of teams of FIANAs from there, um, and then gradually over time was looking more and more at the process of how things work. My own personal background was personal injury, um, again, which has been at the forefront, I would have said, of looking at how we must get more for less and how we must act more efficiently and so on. Um, coming into DLA, the role that I have here is to, as Stephen said, not frighten people. I've got to come in, work with the partners, work with the lawyers, and try and essentially make their lives easier. So it's a relatively simplistic mantra, which is to go in and try and make life easier for the people who are working there, which therefore improves our overall offering. So why is efficiency important? Efficiency is important because I think we've heard the price point in the market's coming down. Every law firm, and I gave a talk at an LSN thing a couple of months ago, every law firm thinks that their strategy to deal with the plummeting price point is to go up the market. We're only gonna do the high-end quality work. And we've got every single law firm now challenging for that high-end quality work rather than all of it. The price point is just coming down in the market. It's true for us, it's true for everybody else. Um, there will be new areas, new emerging areas of law which for a time we can charge a premium for, but over time that changes. And to sustain a business of the size that most of us are operating in, you need to be able to do that stuff at a better price point and more efficiently for clients. The other thing is though, we leave loads of money on the table. We've heard from Stuart. Stuart talks about pricing. We look at two things in terms of, of, of what we do. The first thing is we look at compound discounting. It's not always the first discount that causes you the problem. It's the second, it's the third, it's the fourth, it's the fifth discount, which cumulatively is just chopping off the profitability on top. And for us, that's around 45% of the money we leave on the table. It's through compound discounting. It's a is a failure of discipline and good approach to pricing and negotiation. The other half, or the other part, 55%, you see I'm not a mathematician, uh, is, is, is overproduction. It's doing stuff that the client doesn't want to pay for. And the client doesn't want to pay for it because they never asked you to do it in the first place. It's, it's doing stuff that the client doesn't want to pay for because they thought there was an original scope and the scope's changed and they've not quite realised it and you've not had that grown-up conversation throughout the piece and you've come to the end and they said, well, if you'd have asked me at the time, I'd have said not to do it. It's doing stuff at the wrong level. There's a whole series of things we do because no matter how good we are at negotiating price, when we start to do the work, we just do it the way we've always done it. So this is our kind of practical walkthrough of, of, of our approach. It's a case study of how DLA Piper is looking at project management. So just very quickly, we're going to cover the first question, are lawyers special? I think this is the first challenge whenever you're looking at project management and the response you always get is, are lawyers special? So I'm a recovering lawyer. I can't say I'm fully recovered yet and James would insist working on me, I'm probably not recovered yet. But the question is, are lawyers special? And I think James will answer the question, which is? Quite simply, no. 
Um, the experience that I have of working with lawyers and working in other professional services industries is that, yes, there is a difference, and lawyers do have a difference to other professional services, but there are such similarities across there. Everyone has similar problems, people are people, and quite frankly, it's something where we are different, as the slide says, but not special. So, I don't know how many of you are as old as I am and how many of you remember this sketch. This is one of my favourite sketches uh, by Morecambe and Wise. Uh, and for those of you who haven't seen it, we wanted to play a video, but the video was as long as our, uh, our presentation. We did think that would be a clever way of getting away with not talking very much, but uh, I'll try and do a pricey. Morecambe and Wise invite Andre Previn, who at the time is the foremost conductor in the world, to conduct uh, Eric Morecambe playing the Greek Piano Concerto. Lots of funny things. They get his name wrong. They call him Andre Preview rather than Andre Previn. He starts conducting. And Eric Morecambe just plays nonsense. Just plays absolute nonsense on the, on the piano. Stop, stop, stop. Start again. I wasn't ready. Performs the, per, starts it up again. The conductor, Andre Previn, gives him a cue. He plays just absolute rubbish altogether. And Previn comes up to him and says, you're playing all the wrong notes. And Eric Morecambe gets hold of Previn by the scruff of the neck, which is this picture here. And he says, I'm not playing all the wrong notes. I'm playing all the right notes, but not necessarily in the right order. And that is why legal is different from other areas when you apply project management. Because if you're designing or you're doing a piece of project management around an industrial process, or you're doing a piece of project management around a finance process, A follows, you know, precedes B, precedes C, precedes D. We don't have that luxury in law because we've at least got us and the client. Generally, we've got the other side and their lawyer. Quite often, there's a regulator or a court. And as a result of which, our ability to control the order in which things happen is not the same as in other organisations. So we have to accept that we need to apply something different. So this concept of a square peg in a round hole, um, the experience that I've had of telling people both internally and externally within law firms that I'm a legal project manager is a look of what? You know, the most common question that I'm asked is, well, what do you do? And that's if somebody actually wants to ask it. Most of the time you also get a polite nod and just go, oh, okay, with no actual knowledge about what's going on with that. Um, one of the things that, um, that I've certainly found is it's about stakeholder engagement, um, not necessarily simply talking about um, how to project manage and talking in terms of project management language. The kind of language that uh, traditionally project managers would have used, so mentioning terms such as PRINCE2 or Six Sigma or Lean, it leaves people cold. So one of the main challenges that I've certainly realised with the experience I've had is that it's about speaking in a language that people can understand. So coming on to the next slide that we have here, there's several challenges that are faced um, that certainly, and again I'm speaking for the experience that I've got um, working at DLA Piper. We're looking first of all at this idea of people thinking that they are um, excellent in terms of what they do, doing all the right things, but as we said, not necessarily in the right order. The masses that we deal with are not linear, as Stephen said before. Um, we're not dealing with things, we're not dealing with a production line that's making cars where you simply bolt one piece on after the other. There are variations that will crop up, there are factors that, that, will, that will occur that will cause a difference. The jargon that we talk about, again, frightening people with terminology is just the, the quickest way that I've found of disengaging anybody. And the role that I have as a legal project manager is to try and bring people together. We talked about not frightening people before. And an easy way of frightening people is using the wrong language. So again, trying to find that commonality, trying to find something where we all understand what's happening. Um, a lot of the lawyers that I work with at the minute believe that they're excellent project managers. Now, in this bottom left corner, they take that route that goes all over the place because they will get to the end. They're great, complete finishers. And again, one of the key tasks that I face is trying to get them to go in a more direct route. So, Will we ever reach the, this nadir of a straight line from A to B? Well, probably no. But what in actuality we're trying to do is get somewhere in between those where we can start seeing some benefit from that. Um, analytics, the last slide. One of the problems that I've seen in every firm that I've worked in is the data that we have is not necessarily good. Um, we have vast amounts of data, but the usability of that data is always difficult. Um, 
the way to access it, the way to look at it, the way it's been set up, that's always been a challenge. So one of the key things that I'm looking at at the minute is how we can be smarter about the information that we have ourselves. We have a vast amount of information, we can use it for our benefit, um, and it's about making that process of capturing the data in the first place something which, which actually gives tangible benefit. Yeah, I mean, just picking up on two of those points, I think this whole point of jargon is when we, um, it picks up on the point you were making earlier about uh, EQ and IQ, um, when we're talking within our own profession, we call it terminology. It's fine. We can use Latin phrases. Uh, we can use shorthand. We can talk about AFAs. As soon as we're talking about another profession, it's no longer terminology. It's jargon. And you know, bringing in project management in the traditional sense and applying terms like Lean Six Sigma, talking about boss cards, talking about uh, legal process mapping, it frightens the horses. It's not a good idea. They don't understand why it is. It's another language. It's not as important as what they do. On the analytics point, and, and I think this is really key, is the biggest problem, one of the biggest problems we have is we're just really bad. Even though time is so important and still the majority of what we do, we measure in the time it takes, the quality of the data around that time we spend is pretty bad because it relies on manual inputs in the most part. So, you know, when you deal with litigators, they're very good because they tend to have to justify their time. You deal with the corporate team, it's Project Smith, eight hours. That's it, general. And therefore, having that traditional approach of going through, analysing the data, understanding where the holes are before you start, we're kind of prohibited from doing it. And, you know, we talk to our friends in finance, we talk to our friends in IT, and they say, well, look, why don't we get the lawyers to record time better before we start anything? The problem is if we waited for that to happen, we'd never get started. What we have done as well is we've realised that not one size fits all. Um, project management, in the sense that we use it, will differ from the nature of the work we're doing. And we, we tend to classify our work internally using the genius of Donald Rumsfeld. We think there are three kinds of work we deal with. Um, we think there's work that is known known. It's predictable, it's foreseeable, we do it on a regular basis, we know what it consists of, we understand all the bits on it, and we have one approach for that. We have known unknown work. It's foreseeable, we do it on a regular basis, we're experts at doing it, but actually it's slightly different, it doesn't happen that regularly, you can't really build uh, whole end-to-end -end processes because it's always slightly different. And then there's unknown unknown work the CEO about to get convicted of tax fraud or, or something like that, which, quite frankly, you cannot pre-plan for. And there, we think there are three different general approaches to how you tackle each of those works. It's not a one-size-fits-all. So in terms of the known, known work, the area which I'm working in at present is real estate. And again, we make no bones about it. We're trying to look at the low-hanging fruit in the first place. We're trying to say, where can we go in in terms of the business and find the areas that we can get some maximum benefit quickly. So I'm looking at several key areas. So as an example, uh, the lease renewal process that we do, we have an awful lot of corporate clients who have an awful lot of lease renewals to do. And the process is the same process. Um, the process is used in every, every particular um, instance of a lease renewal, whichever client it may be. But at the minute, um, the way that we deal in the first place is it might be dealt with in one of various different offices, dealt with by various different people, and dealt with in various different ways, quite frankly. So, in order to approach this, the way that we've dealt with this, or the way I've approached this, is to first of all sit down with people from the different offices, coming back to this stakeholder point, ask them how they do it, get them to work out, get them to go through process mapping exercises, which again is a challenge in itself, because you're asking people to do something which is completely outside their comfort zone but get the lawyers to sit there and work out what they actually do, deconstruct it, and turn it into something where we can identify from there a process that we can then say, this is the way that we now deal with this work, we can find the efficiencies within that, and we can then ensure that what we're actually doing is every time we have a lease renewal in the business, we know how it's going to be done, we have some certainty over price. So coming back to the pricing points which have been talked about previously, it starts helping drive those decisions on pricing that we have, because we actually now know how much we can do these things for, whether it's part of a, an individual agreement or an alternative fee agreement or whatever it's part of. Yeah, and I think, as, as, as James pointed out, just as we saw with personal injury was under attack first, this is, this is the area that's under attack now. This kind of work, which is predictable, foreseeable, lots of people in the market do it. We have to do it to keep our clients happy. 
But this is an area that the price is demanding action and you will get people to sit down and focus on how do we do it more efficiently. No one wants this stuff on their billing figures. Um, no one wants to, you know, no one wants that, you know, we're throwing money away, we're doing it at a loss stuff. So this is an area that you're, we, we've found that you get a very ready uh, engagement with around project management. But the, one of the other areas we're looking at is the unknown Sorry, the known unknown stuff. So this is, this is uh, I think, your, your middle category, which is the advisory, uh, kind of trusted advisor stuff. This isn't, the, this isn't the rocket science. I'd argue perhaps nothing we really do is rocket science. This isn't the rocket science. This is the stuff, though, however, which is sufficiently different and sufficiently complex uh, that you can't fully process map through. It's actually a whole series of processes. It's not just one process. Whereas perhaps a lease renewal, there's a start, a middle, and an end. This might be a piece of litigation which bits will or won't complete. This might be a corporate deal which may have due diligence in 15 negotiation sessions. It may have due diligence in two negotiation sessions. Um, what we've done here is we've adopted a really simple model, and it would be probably a five-legged stool if we were to use a stool analogy. The first one is scope. Scope is absolutely essential. Without scope, you can do nothing. I think if, the, if there's one lesson we can learn from the big four in our practice is the way in which the big four scope work. It's scoped to beautiful, intimate detail. And I tell you what, if you deviate from the scope, and I say this as a previous PwC partner, we come back to you and we talk to you about it, um, and, and we have a discussion on price. And the reason why scope is so important is it's the meeting of expectations between us in terms of what we're going to be doing and our clients in terms of what they're going to get. This is where you're going to flesh out the, we don't really want you to do that, or, oh, we didn't realise you had to do that. It's a really good opportunity for you to set um, the assumptions around what the client's going to get in a really appropriate way. Based on the scope, you need to resource plan. Who are you going to get doing what work? Because as we know, not all fee earners are equal. Most of us know that partners are the least profitable resource we have. And for every hour a partner spends on a file, you either make minimal profit or actually sometimes you don't make any profit at all. Trainees are not an incredibly profitable resource. You know, there's always the assumption that <coughs> you're managing something efficiently if you've got a partner and all trainees. Actually, they're the two, two least profitable resources that you can use. If you go down and look at the cost versus uh, what they recover. So have a look at how you're going to resource plan and understand who you're going to get doing what work. The next piece after that is to set the budget. To understand what's the overall price point going to come out at if you do the work to that scope and to that resource plan. And what that again does is gives you the opportunity to have with the client. If the client doesn't want to pay that much money, well, maybe you limit the scope of the due diligence exercise. That's exactly what the big four will do. You don't want to spend that much. Well, maybe we won't look at every single contract. We'll look at the top 100 contracts and we'll give you an opinion on a Pareto principle about what's, what's it going to impact. And that's all well and good. And that's going to start tackling our 45% compound discounting problem that we have in terms of, uh, of the way we leave money on the table. And for us, that 45%, every 1% of that's worth about um, £1 million sterling internationally. So the small, small differences making big value, that's really huge. But after that, we've actually got to deliver it to it. It's all very well pricing the thing, but how are we going to deliver back to that? So we need to monitor and manage what we're doing against that scope, against that resource plan, against that, that price plan. And that comes down to where I think the project managers, having helped the partner price and scope that matter in a more professional way, is how they can help the, proje uh, how they can help the lead lawyers through the matter. We're not suggesting that project management is about deciding that John is better than Jane or Sarah is more efficient than, than Christopher in doing a particular piece of work. That's the partner's decision. That's down to the quality of, of what service we're providing back. But what the project managers can do is, how hot are we running? If we're running hot, why is that? Are we being inefficient? Has the scope changed? Are we doing something we wouldn't have otherwise, you know, we haven't been asked to do? And we can do that in live time. And we've, we've actually bought a project management system that doesn't require you to process map. 
it doesn't give you tons of data after the event so you can analyze because quite frankly still in terms of time recording our data is not going to be that great but what it does do is it allows us to tra track in real time how we're doing against budgets of course the other stage and Stuart picked up on this is you've got to do the post-match review the post-match analysis you've got to see how you did and understand why you did better and this again is where for us legal project management drives a massive value because they can look at how we do the process. Is it a piece of process re-engineering as James has been talking about? Is it the fact that actually looking at a number of these matters, the first partner, partner number one does section B of this kind of transaction more efficiently than partner number two? And why is that? And understand why that is. Is it that if we actually do section E before B, we don't need to do C at all? We can just do away with it because it's an unwanted unwanted part of the process. So that, that rigour will then lead us to where we get to, and this is why it's the known unknown, is it enables us to start breaking out sections. We can't break out the whole piece and process map, but it enables us to start breaking out individual sections. So things like due diligence, things like disclosure. You know, already many of us will be using e-disclosure providers to help us with that work. Increasingly our clients are selecting their own, not because they think they know better than us, just because they're bloody fed up with us not coming up with a viable, cost-effective solution in time, and they're forcing our hand on this. It enables us to look at technology solutions. We're starting to look at what AI can do for us and how AI can drive uh, particular uh, processes to a conclusion more quickly. It doesn't replace lawyers. The whole point of AI is not to replace human beings entirely. That's why IBM call it Watson rather than Holmes. It's not the really intelligent one. It's the slightly less intelligent sidekick. But this innate, you know, in going through this process and understanding the remit and getting this stuff into the known, known unknown category, it gives you an able to break down these individual parts. That leads on to the unknown unknown, which kind of is the rocket science area. So within these matters, the processes that Stephen's just talked about, you run through the same things. You still scope things. You still look at the, the scope of the piece. You look at the pricing. But it's a much more complex matter in most cases. So what we're actually trying to achieve by following that same rigor within this is just more transparency with the client, more understanding about where we're at. Um, you know, there's the analogy that everybody remembers a massive bill at the end of a, a matter that's gone on when they weren't expecting it in the first place. Well, this is about trying to help manage that process as we're going through. So it's about giving more transparency about how we're actually working, what are the challenges that we're facing, and using the rigour that we've said before to try and get to the end point that we need to. Yeah, I mean, this work tends to be slightly less price sensitive by its very nature. Nobody quite knows how it works. Um, I'm sure Dan... Dan and I used to work together at BLP. He used to do all of our analytics um, at BLP. I'm sure Dan will tell you this stuff. It's less price sensitive in the event that um, in the event that this work comes up. But nonetheless, when you come back to service quality, it's important that you communicate with the client. You set a clear expectation around what direction you think you're going. You set some kind of indicative budget. Uh, you have regular communication with the client around how you're doing against those assumptions and, and you check in regularly. So you need to use the same processes. But the, the challenge with this work is it really doesn't allow for process mapping because it, by its very nature, you don't know where it's going to go. But this, this section was talked about as a case study, not just for legal project management, but around service delivery. And we think legal project management is really important for a number of reasons. One, it's going to help us price better. It's going to stop us giving away so much money, so many compound discount points, before we get engaged. It's going to help us manage work better to the assumptions we've made, so we're not going to overproduce so much. And as we said, for every 1% improvement across those two points we make, for us, that's a million pounds sterling per annum. So it's a huge, a huge opportunity based on a very small, very small change. But what this is really going to do for us is, is it's going to give us the opportunity to innovate. It's going to give us the opportunity to start bringing a bit of order from chaos. Because the one thing we all know is our traditional model of having lawyers in offices doing everything for our clients on a matter is gone. 
Those days are gone. We're never going to go back to those days where every single element of what we do, we do is timed and charged back to the client. Our clients are expecting us to deliver them back holistic solutions. They don't really care, I think, if we're honest, around how we particularly, you know, we do particular parts. Yes, they want a guarantee of quality. Yes, they want a guarantee that things aren't going to go wrong. They want to be sure that the data protection is safe and therefore they may sometimes choose not to go to India and they'd rather it was done onshore or in-house or whatever. But practically, they want us to deliver them back an outcome at an agreed price. And for us, the thing about legal project management into service delivery is it's the vanguard. Because the difficulty whenever you do innovation is it's a build it and they will come mentality, particularly in a law firm. Right, we're going to build a centre in... Um, we're going to build a centre in Leeds. We're going to stick a load of paralegals in there. And those paralegals can do all the jobs that shouldn't be done by lawyers at a much more cost-effective point. And, of course, on paper, that's a great strategy. Finance get really excited because they model it and they demonstrate how much more profit we'll make. But the problem is, in terms of practical, you know, in, in terms of practical application, when you're in the crucible of agreeing with a client how you're going to do a piece of work, scoping a piece of work, you're excited, are you going to win it, you're not going to win it, and then delivering that piece of work, it's very difficult to onboard that sort of innovation. You know, do you, I, I understand conceptually that they can do due diligence, but what does that mean to me? So the role of our project managers is not just to help us scope price, it's not help us just manage, but it's also to help us identify opportunities for further innovation, for doing stuff in a different way. And it's to help ensure that that stuff is delivered. And I think for us, that's why of all the innovations, and we say innovation with a small I because really in law we're doing stuff that other industries have all done before anyway, but all of the innovations that we're doing, project management had to come first because it starts bringing some rigour and it starts bringing uh, to somebody their day job to help ensure this stuff happens. Because... There is a limit to capacity, and we have to be honest, and we can send our lawyers on training courses, but we send them on training courses every day for a whole bunch of other things, and they're limited in terms of, of you know, not because they're lawyers, not because they're different or special, but they're limited, like all of us are, into doing different things. I've still not worked out how to use the washing machine at home. I can't do it. I'm really good with the, uh, with the sky box, but I still not worked out how to use the washing machine at home. I just, it's a limit to my capacity. That's my excuse. But we're all limited to what we do. But with project management, it's going to give us the ability to pull these things together and deliver back a seamless service. Because when you're looking at the size of most of, us, most of our organisations, and particularly for us and people like Bakers, where most of the solutions we deliver are multi-office, multi-jurisdiction, quite often multi-discipline, we can't get everything coming back at different times. We can't get everything coming back in different formats. You know, it's all very well having a house style so that everything's in sans serif or it's in, a particular, it's in a particular style. But what about attitudes to risk in Asia versus attitudes to risk in, in, in Germany? And unless you've got somebody whose day job it is to pull all those things together, you're never really going to drive the service. So that's our kind of quick, practical, not a lot of theory, um, approach to how we're doing project management. <laughs>